Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. I guess it's a good thing that this is the real one because I, I feel a little bit more composed than the last two false starts that we had. Yeah, no more giggle fits. <laughs> no more. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, hi, everybody. You're, this is episode 125. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm saying this for the third time. April 8th, 2019, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. It's good to be here, Nick. There he is with his beautiful haircut. What is oh, it? Oh, thank like, you. You're just wearing your hair down. Everybody, yeah, everybody keeps like, I like your haircut. I just didn't put anything in my hair because I was really in a rush this morning. It, and everybody thinks I'm a new person, so it's kind of nice. I, it's super cute. All right. Uh, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> you, hang on. If you're if you're listening to this and want to see Blake's haircut, y- you here's should what watch you should it do. on YouTube. Go to YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you like Blake's haircut. Yeah, leave right. us a comment if you do or don't <laughs> like it. Either way, hit the subscribe button. Hit, the, the, hit that subscribe button. We're, we're close, guys. We're close. Fifteen more. Uh, hey, guys, today we have a lot to talk about. Uh, we are going to be talking about these stickers that uh, can cause Tesla autopilot to swerve into the long, wrong lane. Mm. Uh, Realware announces that uh, Shell, the company, uh, has selected some hands-free computers for field workers. The U.S. Army shows how it'll use HoloLens in the field and Amazon's first HIPAA-compliant Alexa skills to track your health care. Yes. Uh, but first, we've got some programming notes. You can find us on YouTube, like I just said. Everyone go like, subscribe, make Jeff really happy, and, uh, you know, go, go comment about Blake's hair because it's really cute. Oh, All right. goodness. Uh, hey, uh, Blake, we're not going to be back in the studio next Monday because I'm going to be out for Star Wars Celebration. It's a... Uh, it's a Star Wars nerd thing where the, the stream will go until Monday, so I will not be down here in San Diego. I'll be at home watching this, and uh, uh, sorry, everyone, you'll have to wait till Tuesday. But I got, I got a special surprise for everyone who's listening. What do you got, Nick? Next Tuesday, you're going to want to go check out the HFES website because they're going to have a webinar on exoskeletons. Now, this is including uh, a couple folks, including Chris Reed, who we actually had the pleasure of interviewing uh, back at HFES this last uh conference uh and it's uh it's going to be great it's going to be a little talk about uh exoskeletons and and uh what to expect from ergo x this year and um you know it's just a great place to ask all your questions if you have questions i strongly encourage you to email some to show at humanfactorscast.com is that a new hey email? it is yeah it Woo! Is. uh yeah so we, and, and because we're in the programming notes i did uh we, we did uh give the website a little facelift if you uh have been around recently. So now it looks like it's not from 1995, but it looks like it's from 2005. Yeah, got a dark you know, mode we, going and everything. We got a whole decade. Um, yeah, we added, we added some bios about ourselves, including a, a, a news RSS feed, so that way you can stay up to date with all the news stories that we're posting in our Slack. Um, it's, a gr- it's a great place uh, to, to find more information about the show. Uh, so yeah, go check out the new website. Go check us out on YouTube. And check out that ErgoX webinar next week. Uh, but first, I got to know... What's going on in Blake's world? Oh, man. So you and I have kind of gone back and forth on the podcast before about, like, tracking our health and fitness. Oh, yeah, we have. And using different odds and ends for different types of devices. You recently just upgraded to, like, a Samsung watch, right? I did, yeah. So I I upgraded to the uh, Samsung Galaxy Watch Active. Wow. That's a a mouthful. That's a mouthful of words. Yeah, it Uh, is. But anyway, so... I I really kind of have taken for granted the amount that I relied on my Fitbit to kind of drive me to at least get the two ten thousand steps a day. You're not wearing one. Tra- no, because somebody who I know and love has taken my charger and hidden it from me. Why? Because uh, she accidentally took it on a trip with her. What kind of charger do you need? It, no, it's just like the specific Fitbit one. We have two different sized ones, and she grabbed the smaller one, which was for mine uh, versus hers. Oh, bummer. But it's funny because I've been like checking my phone or whatever, thinking I was going to like check how I slept last night. and like sure. I've been sleeping over the past week, and it's been weird that I definitely have been a little bit more sedentary than normal, even though I kind of do some of my normal workouts. You don't have any of those like passive reminders yeah. to get up and move. Which I, I kind of thought were like, oh, those are cool reminders, but I don't really depend on them. But it, it's apparent Apparently that you do. some of it does, yeah. So I don't know. It's been weird without that. And it was kind of a funny thing to retrospectively think about. That's kind of a cool, uh, yeah, like a like a analysis of what you, Fitbit actually does for you. It's a case study. Yeah, it's actually modifying my behavior. Yeah. Much to my chagrin. That's funny. Yeah, what's, that's interesting. What's been up with you, Nicholas? Uh, well, I have a couple things I could talk about. Uh, I So you know what? You just brought up Fitbit. So I'll talk about my Galaxy Watch. So um, the reason I got this thing and finally jumped ship from Fitbit was because... 
this was the watch that was supposed to bring um, uh, blood pressure monitoring to uh, a watch. And, of course, you can only get this through, like, a third-party research app. And you can only get it if you can take your blood pressure with the Samsung 10 fleet of phones. And I have the 8 fleet of phones. Oh, no. So I can't even get the app because um, it won't let me on my phone. And so now I can't get it on my watch, which means... I just kind of switched over for no reason. Although that's frustrating, I will say this is a little bit more lenient than Fitbit in the track in the fact that like I can track my water from my wrist, and I didn't realize how much of a big deal that was to me. Like I am tracking my water intake every day. I can quick add calories, so if I like eat a prepackaged protein bar or something, I can just go oh 180 uh, and throw it in, and it links into my Fitness Pal. Uh, and I've been tracking it across two different services because one is like weirdly time. Um, it's it's got the wrong time on it, so it'll like log tonight's dinner as tomorrow's breakfast or something like that. And that's odd. It's, it's really weird. I don't know what's going on, and I still haven't figured it out. But uh, overall, I like it. I think it's it's nice. Um, I'm really bummed about the uh, blood pressure monitoring though, because the whole point is that's why I got it. Yeah, it kind of sucks. And obviously, I mean, you didn't know when you bought it that they were going to push for only no. People with and the they they went as far series. as they went as far as like taking away all their promotional materials that boasted the blood pressure. So something tells me that they're no longer going to support that claim and oh, it's like Oh, so it's just all kinds of nonsense going yeah, on. Yeah, it's it's bad luck. But like you where uh you know, you kind of didn't really pay attention to your health data. I found myself more and more over the last couple of weeks uh, kind of obsessively tracking my health data, um, almost unhealthily, right? Like the the water intake and the calorie intake and uh, the subjective measures that I mentioned before on food, right? And it's like all this stuff I'm tracking and I'm still looking for that place to integrate all of it. I'm still looking. So what are you trying to do when you say integrate all of it? You want like some kind of aggregator? I do. So, like, th- there's several different ways in which I collect data about myself, right? So I have I have the Fitbit scale, right? And that's tied into Fitbit and their ecosystem. Oh, I didn't uh, know they had, like, a scale. That's they have a cool. Wi-Fi scale. So you step on it. It logs your weight. It understands if you're within a certain percentage of your last weigh-in, you know, who you are. What? Um, and it'll automatically log it, right? So, like... Super cool. So you don't have to go in and manually press it. It's just it, the scale doesn't lie, and, and you can step on it, and it will, like... It will just show you a trend over time. Scales don't um, lie. So oh, the air's okay. Go, the air's back. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's really hot in here. I'm like sweating. Uh, so if you're we on might YouTube, have to get our fans. Yeah, we need to. Uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, subscribe for for sweat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So so uh, again, like. I'm I'm getting my weight from Fitbit. I'm getting now my activity tracking and my calorie tracking from like uh, Samsung and my Fitness Pal, and then I get like I have a Nokia uh, temperature thermometer uh, that you like just aim at your head, and so like it tracks your your uh, body temperature as well. And what? I use that far and few between, right? Like when I'm sure. sick. But I want some central repository for all that stuff uh, as kind of like a dossier for me. So that way, next time I go to the doctor, well, when was the last time you weren't feeling ill? And I can go, oh, well, here's my temperature. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, here's my, um, here's my activity around that time. You know, I was very sedentary around that time. I was only taking a couple thousand steps a day because I was sick. Um, and, you know, kind of having that one place for everything. Yeah, dude. That sounds awesome. And, I mean, especially if you were able to actually bring that to your doctor, which, I mean, that can go one of two ways, right? You could have, like, a, if it depends on your general practitioner or who you take it to. They could be really accepting and right. really stoked about it, or they can just kind of be like, ah, I feel like you're trying to tell me what, I'm, what I already know. Yeah, and, I, I, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me is that, like, it paints a picture over time rather than just the snapshot when you go to the doctor, right? And that's kind of the stuff that Elise was talking about from the healthcare symposium. You want to look at data over time rather than just uh, in in the moment, right? Yeah, it's it's one of the reasons where I've thought about wearing like a device, like a continuous blood glucose monitor, just yeah. to know over time, like what what different foods are really affecting me and how do they affect my body and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've been pricking myself too, and that's handled in a different app. And then like I just want it all in one place, so that way I can see kind of how timeline it all lines up. You know, I don't know. Uh, so that's me getting getting all nerdy about that stuff. But next week. Next week's banter is going to be all about Star yeah, Wars, man. All, you thought Woo! this week's was nerdy. Wait till next week. Woo. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, you got anything else before we get into this next part of the show? What's the next part of the show? 
That's Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors. It's going to be anything from, uh, we got some automation in there. We got some we do. VR, AR, uh, you know, all that stuff. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. I I never really liked this part of the song. It kind of sounds like, you know, 90s. It feels like it's part of Super Smash Brothers. Oh, I can hear that. You yeah, know, it kind of feels like... Uh, to me, it kind of reminds me of like that '90s glamour, like uh, catwalk. Yeah, it's very uh, Robin Sparkles. And then it, it comes back into this like groovy thing. Anyway, we're talking about the music. Hey, uh, here we go. All right, so Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, up first. So last week, researchers from Tencent's Keen Security Lab showed how the tr- how to trick the lane detection system in a Tesla Model S to both hide lane markings that would be visible to the, to a human and create markings that a human would ignore, which, under some specific circumstances, can cause Tesla's autopilot to swerve into the wrong lane without warning. The security researchers identified a few other things with Tesla, with the Tesla that aren't really vulnerabilities, but they're kind of in- interesting nonetheless, like the ability to trigger the rain sensor with just using an image. So they were able to control the Tesla with a gamepad using vulner- vulnerability that Tesla says it's already been patched, but Tesla appears to be saying that this is not a real-world concern, only because the driver can take over the car at any time. So in other words, it's absolutely a real-world concern, and drivers should be prepared to take over at any time because of it. So while the potential for this to become a real actual problem for Tesla's autopilot is very small, the demonstration does leave us with a few open questions. Like, what happens if there are some random white spots in the road that actually fall into a similar pattern, like these stickers that were used? And what other kinds of brittleness have not yet been identified? Tesla has a lot of miles of real-world testing, but the real world is very big, and long tail of, of the ver- and the long tail of very unlikely situations is always out there waiting to be stepped on. So, Nick, this is pretty nuts that somebody was able... Well, one, that there's actually companies out there, I guess, doing stress tests on, you know, Tesla Model S's or Tesla cars in general, but they were able to trick it and control it with a gamepad. Sorry, I'm like nerding out about the gamepad, but the sticker, okay, hang on, let's go talk about the sticker real quick, because sure. the sticker is fairly innocuous. Like, I when, I when I first read this article, I was like, what does the sticker look like? That Like, how big does it have to be to make this thing actually perceive, like, the lane is going into another... The, uh, the oncoming traffic, right? And if you're looking at the video online, it is very tiny. It's a very tiny sticker. It's just a little dot on the road that would indicate another piece of information for the Tesla to interpret as uh, part of the lane. So they take a look, the Tesla takes a look at this dot and it thinks, oh, I got to go to the left of this dot. And then suddenly you're in oncoming traffic. It, it thinks it's part of the curvature of the road. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure something like this will get patched, but. Uh, You know, it's just it kind of to me kind of outlines sort of the um, how we're still in the infancy of like uh, automated vehicles and and, uh, you know, sort of machine learning about environments. Absolutely. I mean, I think so. I don't know. The the way this is phrased in the title makes it sound like a really, really bad thing. But in the end of the day, I mean, it talks a little bit about the fact that Tesla does have a lot of hours being like, quote unquote, real world road tested. But at the same time, I mean, it's people that are looking for extra variables that maybe a tester at Tesla wasn't thinking of. Or there's even third party security companies that are testing these kind of problems out with autopilot mode. Uh, they could potentially, you know, save somebody's lives or be able to inform, like, the next iteration of whatever patches that Tesla needs to make. So I think ultimately it's a good thing to find. Um, but it, it is kind of odd that it's something so small and minuscule that's actually making some of these changes in how the autopilot runs. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the, l- let's talk about some of the other hacks that they were able to pull off. So they also said uh, controlling by gamepad. Uh, they also said... Which I would rather just drive <clears throat> the car by gamepad. Uh, would you, though? Because, I mean, like, if, if you're looking at the video, again, sorry for audio listeners, we'll try to describe it. As they're... So they're they're driving with the D-pad, and uh, every time they hit the D-pad, it kind of does this, like, jerking motion, but they're able to control it, which is kind of cool. Like, if you can con- if you can adjust the control curve, so that way, you know, as, as you veer left or right, you're only slightly increasing, or slightly... Uh, panning the steering wheel left or right versus, you know, a hard left, a hard right. Yeah. You have to get that control curve down uh, in order to drive, right? And I think there's a lot of... 
video be pretty... games out there that you could steal a control curve from and it'd yeah. be fine. Yeah. Um, but they also, uh, let's see here, what were some of the other things? Oh, triggering the rain sensor with an image. Um, uh, let's see, controlling with a gamepad. Yeah, so the rain sensor with an image, that's interesting as well. Um, because if the car is, like, let's say they are are being, the, the autopilot would be more cautious if it was raining, right? And, and it would try to sort of understand visual cues in a different way because it's through a filter. If that's just a sticker, then you are uh, potentially overcorrecting for an environment that's not um, true to the real world, and uh, that overcorrection could endanger other lives on the road. Most definitely. I I think one part that is a little bit concerning is kind of Tesla's response. Now, I don't know where this came from or if it's just kind of a PR-style response, but, I mean, them saying that ultimately a driver can take control. Well, in some in some ways, like, autopilot is making that very, very difficult, and I don't even know that the intention should always be that you're, some driver is going to be able to hop back into the loop and be able to take control, whether especially if it's one of these sensors that's going wrong, where it's not necessarily an anomaly the of like other drivers it's just something the sensor is picking up wrong and making the wrong decision for so. yeah th- that is a little worrisome right like because yeah it, it's just like it, it makes no sense for us as human factors practitioners however like you know keeping the driver in the loop is a big part of it and everyone knows uh it's like human factors 101 that the human in autonomous systems that's that's the biggest challenge uh, is keeping that human informed of what the system is doing at all times and if the system doesn't even know what it's doing, uh, then it can't convey that accurately to the human that is uh, supervising this um, autonomous vehicle. Yeah, I just feel like the supervisory control on like anybody's behalf, and I'm not saying that every Tesla driver is doing this, but I feel like I would have a hard time only paying attention to the road if I was letting autopilot run. I mean, maybe the first few times I'd be a little bit terrified that I'm letting a car drive on autopilot. But after a while, if you get comfortable, you get with comfortable it, with it. You yeah. sit there and you play on your phone and not be paying attention, or I don't know, be doing something else that just takes your mind off the road anyway. I've seen videos of people going, "Okay, I'm going to fall asleep on the road with Tesla's autopilot," and they like put their hand on the steering wheel and they go, and they go to sleep. Oh, that's so wild! And it's like, yeah. <laughs> so but then you hear about a story about three little stickers that can make the whole whole thing whole operation off. crumble. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, why don't we get into the next story here? Pretty crazy. All right. Real world or no nope. real wear real wear the industrial hands free knowledge transfer platform for frontline workers today announced that Shell has selected real wears hands free head mounted real wear. Can you say real wear one more time? Real wear. MTZ one one Z one. Platform to support in digital transformation of its operations. The devices are being deployed through Honeywell in 12 different countries, including the U.S., China, Russia, India, and Germany, along with 24 operational sites. So in a, in a new era of computing, it's definitely arriving. So just as laptops and mobile phones are the standard for desk workers, voice command and augmented reality for wearable computers will become commonplace for field staff in industry, driving safety and productivity. So the RealWear helmet display is an intrinsically safe voice-controlled device with a micro display that shows an image to a user if they are viewing, if they're using the seven-inch viewing screen. So the head-mounted computer is the world's first com- commercially available device that permits field workers in highly restricted zones to use wear- a wearable device where potentially explosive gases are present, helping to reduce health and safety work hazards. So this is kind of nuts but it also follows a trend that i feel like i've seen come up a bunch of like the integration of voice technology either in the workplace or just in general to increase productivity and in this case maybe even increase safety yeah so the first question i had was what is the hmt1 uh and you know because like you you hear sort of wearable computer and you know what does that entail like what kind of what kind of uh options are, are, are you looking at like a google uh uh, lens yeah like, kind of like google glass google or a hololens yeah. or a hololens like what kind of thing is this and looking at this design it looks like it's very much designed for these types of workers where you don't need a hard hat right there's like the the biggest thing to me is that there's absence of kind of the dome structure that you see in a lot of these other things right google glass less so but the hololens for sure has a lot of things in front uh occluding your view 
Um, but this one just has a single strap that goes over your head. And y- honestly, you kind of look like I'm going to bring it back to Star Wars a lot today because of Star Wars Celebrate. I was so excited. Like, but this kind of looks so like ready. something Lobot would wear from yeah. Empire Strikes Back. Um, so uh, th- this is not the first time we brought Lobot up on the show. No, of course Because it's Jeff not. used it as a, as a thumbnail one time. Jeff, used it as a thumbnail in this one. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, show production while we're doing but, the show. But, I mean, so this is, this is cool because it has sort of this flippable mic that comes forward so you can do speech control. It has this camera so the system is understanding what's around you. And it sounds like there's this little screen uh, kind of down by the mic where you can glance down and kind of get a, get a picture of it. Although... Uh, that picture is really small, and so I'm wondering, like, what kind of thing uh, you're looking at there. Well, I think in the graphic that you were looking at, it actually looks like it projects the screen a little bit. It does look like that, but I'm not sh- so sure. Yeah, that could just be, you know, some sleek graphics they put together. But I'm not really sure, because it does say that it's a small, like, 7-inch display. But if it wasn't, you know, kind of augmenting it on your own reality, if you will, I don't know how much utility they'd get out of it. Um but I think it's awesome to see that obviously they this company has learned a lot from the application of HoloLens and then the release of Google Glass, and so they've gone and realized that okay, there there is a market for this kind of technology, but I think it is really starting in industrial settings. Yeah, um, which is uh, so. So the big point of this ar- ar- article argument article <laughs> big point of this thing is that uh, you know we we're seeing more and more companies here sort of commit to this technology out there and. Um, you know, there, it's it's starting to be these wearable computers are starting to be more and more commonplace among these workers. Whereas, like you know, a computer is something that you and I would use at work. These are becoming more and more commonplace for everybody else, and it's just making everybody's lives that much easier. Yeah, it sounds like the voice control and like different types of virtual assistants are just going to become more and more commonplace in any kind of work setting. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? I do not. Yeah, it's kind of kind of straightforward. Hey, there's there's a uh, you know. There's technology out there that lets people compute on their faces. Face computer. Face computers. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive (laughs) Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Well, have you ever wondered if we uh, talk during those those little interviews, those little commercial breaks? No. The answer is no. You heard Blake laughing. I didn't laugh. I don't know who that was. Who was that? That was you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyway, uh, before we continue, though, I just want to thank all of our friends at IEEE Spectrum, Realware, and CBS News for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack for links to the original articles. One other place you can also go is that RSS feed on our website. Check oh, that out. Hey. man. Uh, go subscribe to us on YouTube. All right, Blake, what are we... <laughs> <laughs> just slip that just in there. Uh, yeah, just slipping that in there. Okay, okay. Uh, right. What do we got up next? So what we got up next, when Microsoft employees balked at the company's $479 million HoloLens contract with the U.S. Army, it raised a question, just what would this system actually look like? What would this system actually look like? Uh, a HoloLens that would look like Call of Duty, I guess. So, oh. but you now have a, now we have a better idea. So the Army has given CNBC an early demo of its integrated visual augmented system, which is a modified HoloLens 2 to provide both combat assistance and training. So it reportedly feels like a real life call game of Call of Duty, and you can see the squads. You can see your squad's position on the map. You have a compass, and you even have your own weapons reticle. So thermal imaging would help you see in the dark, without as much of much of the telltale glow as the existing kind of night vision headsets. And in training, the IVAS can also provide data to improve performance, such as the wearer's gaze and heart rate. So instructors could coach soldiers on their aim or to or room cleaning techniques, for instance. So the demo was clearly meant to sell people on the concept of an 
of this kind of and allay any kind of concerns of those who are kind of twisting the peaceful technology into a destructive tool. However, this doesn't really change some of the core objections from Microsoft staffs and or other critics. So it's kind of an interesting take for, I guess, the Army to go ahead and just grab a HoloLens 2 and modify it to what they wanted to do. Um, and it, it sounds like, I mean, they're able to implement some of the features and even bring in data data like you like we were talking about with kind of just your health data in terms of like heart rate and that kind of stuff to kind of train soldiers. But I don't know. It's kind of strange that to see this. I mean, are they trying to get Microsoft to reconsider actually taking on the contract? I don't know. Who knows? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's we're, we're skirting around this topic again, and yeah. I don't know. Um, I think it's it's kind of cool to see that they've modified these to fit in a situation where they normally wouldn't. Uh, so they have modified these to, um, you know, allow for helmets, to uh, work with soldiers. So that's cool. Um, I mean, obviously the training application of this has just, it, uh, it could potentially, you know, cut down on costs that, that are associated with training now. It could also, you know, make more pro like more proactive or more, you know, in tuned soldiers or help you like create a say within teams. There's just a lot of kind of positive aspects when you think about a training as the training aspect of the whole thing. But I think the, from what I understood, a lot of the pushback that when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago from Microsoft's kind of critics or even employees that work there was the application kind of in the field versus just as a training tool. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't know what else to say about this. Like, this is this is cool. This is cool. This is the application is great. Um, I think you know if we if we really think about what this means in the long term. I think right now it's starting with health data. Right now it's starting with these other things and and maybe training soon. But how long? Like night vision is already starting to get there. Right? They they touted um, using uh, thermal in- imaging. As, as an application of this. Yeah, it's way better than what exists now. So it's it's like, are they just going to buy a bunch of HoloLens 2s and just modify them as needed yeah. like, using a different contractor? I don't know. It, that It's kind of a tough situation for Microsoft to be in because you got your it's a lot of money on the table, but you have half of your employees are just not happy about it at all. Um, at the same time, w- you have to have the conversation with yourself, which we've had on the show multiple times, it seems, especially in the past couple of months, about yep. like how close do you allow your company to get to the spear and what does that really mean um, in terms of your own company's values and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so a lot of applications and implications for the technology itself. Um, it's kind of scary, of course, that what what comes out is exactly what I think my, people at Microsoft or even other critics would be worried about. I mean, the quote that it feels like a real-life game of Call of Duty. Yeah. That's similar to kind of people's problems with, you know, US, UAS operators being in a trailer so far away from, you know, combat and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, they're showing things like projected maps. They're showing things like waypoints. They're showing things like, uh, you know, these typical HUD elements that you might see in a first-person shooter game, like uh, bearing um, or, uh, you know, and, and thinking about the application of this, right? Like, if somebody tags an adversary on the battlefield, like that location could be shared across multiple devices and they could track it through multiple devices. And like that or multiple people that are in the exactly field. that's yeah. Well, multiple devices hooked up to people. Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, to me, it's like a slippery slope. Um, but I don't know. Uh, like they're still, so they're still too big for, for helmets, but they're like getting there, I guess, according to the CNBC article. Um, they they explained that they picked Microsoft um, because uh, it's abnormal that a vendor has direct input from soldiers for like two weeks. So I don't know. There's that too. But then you have this whole Microsoft employee thing, and it's like, where where's that going to go? I, I don't know, man. This this whole thing kind of bums me out because it's technology that I find really enjoyable, and it's a field that you know we're working in, and it's like, how close to the trigger do you get? Yeah, it, it this we had this conversation. I feel like often weekly, and, and I, it's a weekly thing now. Almost. Yeah, and I I don't even know what to do, what to really think about it because I think it. Oh man, I don't know. I think it is a good application of what exists. 
but I can see people's pushback on it. If it's just not something they sign up to work on in general, okay, that's perfectly fine. But on the flip side of that, if this it makes you know soldiers' lives more or makes their time in combat more safe or they are better trained because that's they paper, use something yeah. like something like this. It's hard for me to be like, oh, that's a bad idea. That's objectionable because other people will get hurt because of it. Um, it's it's just a harsh reality, I think, of technology, too. Yep. Uh, let's put this application to something else. Like, let's say laser tag, right? So you can see in the dark. That's cool. Um, you could tag your uh, the other people, the other Basically team. Basically, like Apex Legends. You're yeah. tagging things. Tag them. Uh, contextual base uh, ping system. Um you load up 100 soldiers into a plane and then drop them off all over an island. And then uh, they are able to see, you know, uh, I'm going off the rails here. But you can see, like, the application is there. And I guess if I put it in the laser tag perspective, I can I can see the applications. But let's leave it at laser tag, I guess. Like, I don't yeah, know, like, leave it at uh, laser tag. All right, we got one. Leave it as a training regiment. I don't know. We got one more story. Let's go ahead and cover that thing. Because this, this one's, this one's a, a, a little bit of... Happy news. So much happy. Yeah, this is way, way more on a lighter note. So Alexa's involvement in healthcare is about to get extended well beyond putting Echo speakers in hospital rooms. Amazon has unveiled its first ever HIPAA compliant Alexa skills, letting you just use your voice assistant to take care of sensitive medical issues. So Providence St. Joseph's health skill can book a same day appointment, for example, while the Cigna and Express scripts have been in inter- have introduced skills that respectively track wellness incentives and manage prescriptions. Livongo, meanwhile, has a skill for diabetics that can provide blood blu- blood glucose readings and health tips. And other skills are also coming from Atrium Health, Boston's Hospital Post Surgery Program, and Swedish Health Connect. Amazon has also been making a HIPAA eligible environment available for Alexa developers on invitation on an invitation basis in the U.S. So you can expect that other skills that transmit sensitive health data will be coming and rolling out over the next coming months. The company is well aware that the people will be nervous about trusting their medical information with a voice assistant. And in a statement to TechCrunch, Amazon has assured them that secure that it securely stores data and access controls to data through encryption. So this is a pretty amazing application of Alexa that I just really would not have thought of. Um, and the fact that it may may or may not be, I don't know how tongue-in-cheek this is, in hospital rooms. So that's already a pretty cool application of some of this stuff. But um, this goes along with something you, something you were talking about at the beginning of the show, Nick. This is kind of bringing a bunch of disparate pieces of information together in the healthcare setting. Yeah, I, I want one. I want one. Uh, so you have to... I'm gonna. I, I hate to end this with a bummer, but you He's have to. He's gonna do it. You have to think about the security concerns with this too, right? So it's yeah. HIPAA compliant, but uh, if Amazon can't, if that Amazon device, I'm not gonna say it. Um, if that Amazon device cannot distinguish your voice from somebody else, and that somebody else can schedule you an appointment, can um, potentially access your health records. And yeah. uh, find out information about you, and and maybe not this initial app, but somewhere down the line, you know, that that could be a real concern. Now, let's look at the positive. This can uh, severely impact, uh, in the best way possible, uh, somebody who has mobility issues or um, uh, accessibility issues. This is a voice, right? So you can schedule an appointment or something along those lines with a voice, and that is so cool. It is, it's pretty epic. I mean, even for people on the go, and I mean, you have a, I'm not going to say your name, you have one of these devices. Yes, I do. So I can imagine walking or walking around the house or you're like heading out the door, but you know you need to schedule an appointment or pick up a script or whatever it may be, being able to just order it through voice very quickly as you're maybe going out the door, as you yeah. come in after a long day. In your car, yeah. even. That's yeah. It, it even better. Um, one thing that I that I am a little worried about with the, co- the security concern thing, and I took this out of the blurb, is although Amazon talks about the fact that they do require like some very high level of uh, security when they store data and they encrypt it and all that kind of good stuff, they do put it on the developers to basically follow best practices in terms of security. And I, as, we, I, as I think we've come to find over the past probably year or two, I think uh-huh. that varies across applications oh, yeah. that are created and developers that are employed and all that kind of stuff. So... Hopefully we'll see a little bit more push towards transmitting sensitive health data. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think you hit it spot on the nose there. Um, 
Right on the beak. Right on the beak. Uh, hit the bullseye. All right. You ready? Are you? It came from. It came from. <laughs> All right. We're switching gears. We're getting to it came from Reddit. Uh, this is the part of the show where we search over that thing. The internet. <laughs> that place. That place. Place, that place on the internet that we are, uh, where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics. The community that could be anybody, that could be UX, that could be human factors, that could be anything, as long as it relates to the field of human factors. As long as it does. Yeah, we got uh, we got a couple this week, right? I usually read these, right? I, it's been so long since we've done a Reddit. I feel. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you usually <laughs> read them? I think so. Okay, maybe. Yes, I'm Maybe's gonna say yes. Comment on YouTube. Let us know who usually yeah. reads these. Yeah, uh, go subscribe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, we got time for a couple. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get right into these here. So this one was posted by BYU Zanaxia um, five days ago. Uh, how do you explain a concept? They go on to write, I'm doing a project with space data. We're supposed to think innovative concepts that use big data from space for safe city solutions. I study multimedia design. Think of Internet of Things, smart city things. Uh, to get an idea of the type of concepts, you can look here. They provide a link. Uh, we're doing presentations for groups of people, and this we need to explain the value of our concept. However, I find it hard to make it understandable. In my head, it's all clear, but if I start explaining it to people, they look like I talk a different language. I've got a huge amount of research, and I feel like I'm getting lost in details when I explain this. I've also gotten the feedback that I tend to go from point A to C, back to B, forward to Z, but will first explain a little more. Are there any known methods for explaining concepts? This is a great question. Thank you for pulling this, Blake. Oh, you're still welcome. What do you think? Man, so this is something I feel like we deal with on a constant basis. Uh, just because we're, con- I don't know, I feel like I'm consistently doing research, gathering data to try and either inform designs or decisions about products. And it's all about how do you convey that information that you've gathered and worked towards to stakeholders. So I feel like we get a lot of experience doing this. One yes. thing that I would say is important here is it's a, it seems like you went and did a whole lot of research for a specific topic and you need to go and convey that to somebody else best way that I know how to do that is kind of one, know your audience very well. Like who are you presenting these things to talk about it on a weekly podcast? Yeah, there you go. Exactly. You'll soon get feedback uh, if you're clear or not. Yeah. I mean, people will subscribe to you on YouTube or they will not. Thank you. (laughs) But knowing your audience and knowing kind of what their motivations are, because I'm not sure if this is a class project or what it may be, but if there are people that you're trying to pitch this concept to, though, or like pitch your startup idea to, you want to know what they value the most and kind of hit on key points like that. Um, another thing is to really, this is better to do up front, but based on whatever research that you've done, really hammer out what the research goals were. And if, if you went about <laughs> researching these things, did you actually meet those goals? What did you find? So I think it's just important to like have a nice overall structure of kind of what did you do, why did you do it, and then here's what you found overall. But you want to convey it in a way that's most important to your stakeholders. But anyway, Nick, what do you got for how do you d- communicate a concept? Uh, there, um, There's a whole subreddit <clears throat> called Explain Like I'm Five. And it's it, it would it, it would be in your best interest if you tried to explain this concept to a five year old. Uh, one thing that could help is to try to write out your response ahead of time. If you get this asked so frequently that you are having difficulties explaining it every time, I think it would be sort of in your best interest to go and like kind of write this thing out. And talk about it with somebody who is like a friend of yours that may not know every detail about what you're working on. And then you talk it through and say, hey, this is my thing. This is point A. This is point C. This is point B. And they'll go, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think you should say that before. And just ask somebody for honest feedback. Um, Get somebody to kind of proofread it. And, like, oh, you're getting two in the weeds there. You are getting um, way in the the weeds there. Uh, Just kind of keep it high level, right? And I think that exercise alone of going through it with somebody else who's naive to the topic uh, will help you sort of identify the types of things and in what order to present that information in. Uh, it goes back to school when you're like preparing for a, a uh, presentation or something and you just recite the same thing over and over again. You want to just drill it into your head until you, you can recite it. Um, 
uh, from memory. And uh, I don't know. I feel like that's a that's a good exercise to do to kind of narrow it down. Definitely. The more confident you are in what you're about to say to somebody, I think the better you're able to think, or from my perspective, you're better to think on your feet a little bit quicker because you already know what you're talking about. You're pretty well versed in what, you, what you're going to say, so you can focus a little more on somebody asks a question. Okay, I can explain the concept or I can think on my feet about how to answer whatever they may have asked. Right, yeah. It's all about structure, so get that structure down about how to communicate and I think I think you'll be okay. All right, we got uh, what two more here? Let's do uh, this one. Was by my God, it's full of stars. Uh, all the stars. All of the stars. They were uh, the the title is hired as a product design lead in a small startup. Boss wants to outsource visual design. Whoa, <laughs> I can see where this one's going. Oops. Uh, I'm in a few days into my new position. One which I was led to believe revolved around the ownership of the entire UX process, from research to interaction design to visual design to prototyping and testing. My new boss is enamored with this designer's work, and as we discussed prior to me coming on, wants to use him for establishing the brand and identity of the company. Totally cool with that. Today, the day before meeting this person, he sits down to go. Uh, he sits me down to go over what he's thinking, and it includes the visual design of, for our core product. He sees this as logical because this person will craft the visual identity, and therefore they should extend that into the product. I thought I illustrated in many, many ways how I thought it'd be beneficial if the product design component was under my purview, but he seems apprehensive. Has anyone had a similar experience? Uh, that can maybe lend some advice. Thank you. I will say the edit in a little bit. Absolutely. So this is an interesting conundrum, right? Because this guy kind of lays out the process that in, in, I guess, in past jobs or how he had planned to tackle the current one from research all the way to, you know, interaction design, then to visual design, prototyping, and testing. And now you've got to deal with a boss at a startup, which is likely maybe your CEO even, who's yeah. decided that, okay, this visual designer, I really like the stuff they create. Where we're just going to use whatever they make, and you'll be the product design lead, but basically we're going to go with whatever the visual designer makes. This is kind of a tough place to be in, but as the product design lead, you've got to figure out how you're going to deal with it. And I think there's a couple ways that you can go about it. And one might be just being okay with the fact that you're not going to be the person that is doing all the visual design, because uh, it seems like seems like from the post, maybe that's part of the problem is you wanted to be more clued into that at least or rolled into the process. Because um, as a startup, like as I'm sure you're aware, you're going to be doing things really, really fast. And you just don't have time to do anything but get the MVP product put together and out the door. Yeah. What you can do as a design lead, though, is work very closely with this visual designer to understand, like, okay, from a functional standpoint, how does this design you're creating work? Does it solve the problem that your user base has? Do you even know that at this point, or is this all just visual designs they've created based off of just talking to the CEO? You can test these designs and try, and if you really feel strongly that some of the visual design needs to be changed or different aspects of the interaction are just not quite correct based on what's been done, then you'll have ammo to actually make those changes. I'd say just ultimately keep running the like user-centered design process that you intended to use, but just act like you're already further down in the process. Can I be honest what this sounds like to me? Please do. This sounds like this person's getting, like, their ego bruised a yep. little bit. That's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, and maybe maybe, th maybe this is one of their first jobs, and they don't know what that's like. Um, learn to delegate. Learn to, uh, you know, sort of, y you're not everything. You can't do everything. Uh, those are what we call unicorns. And why do we call them unicorns? Because they don't exist. Um you are not everything, and you just do the thing that you are meant to do the best you can. Uh, and, um, you know, also, if somebody above you is making those decisions, it's out of your control. I mean, you can try to influence it as much as you can, but ultimately it's their decision. The buck stops with them. Uh, so just work with what you got. Like, it's a job, and I understand it can be frustrating when... Um, you are capable of doing something, but they're hiring somebody else to do that job. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that that's not what you were hired for, and that's not what your position entails right now. Uh, so don't get all don't get your bru ego bruised. And I feel like really heartless when I say this. Like, 
Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with it because I think you're right. The tone of the way it's written really feels like that. And if I was to take a guess, this is this person's not their first job, but it's their first product design lead job. Mm. So they're used to yeah. doing kind of the full gamut of things. And now they've got to figure out how to live in this leadership role, which they may have before been the like sole UX designer, or designer of any kind at a company. So they're used to just having control. And now you've got to figure out how to work with a team and basically manage a design that already exists. And it's, it's kind of a fun new challenge. I think it'll be, if you kind of look at it a different way than like, ah, oh, there's this visual designer that it's not exactly how I want it to be. We'll see what you can do to either influence it or find out that it actually was well designed. So this is interesting. So the edit. So I didn't read the edit before we actually said anything. So edit. This has been extremely helpful. So thanks to all who responded. The thoughts seem to be pretty polarizing between do what's best for the company and do what's best for you, which I kind of expected. The perspective had, has definitely been helpful in affirming that I will need to put my ego aside. There it is. And uh, use this as an opportunity to just focus on making the best possible product. Whatever happens, happens. Well, there like you go. It. Like it a lot. Okay, we got one more here. This is from user Dinos97 one day ago. We got, uh, are there any online tools to analyze a card sort done in real life with paper? Uh, wondering if anyone knows website where I can put the outcome of my card sort and it will analyze it and potentially interpret the results. Thanks in advance. Now, I grabbed this one for a very specific purpose. Why did you grab this one? Because I figured you'd have a snarky answer. It's your job to analyze. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, well, you could use Excel or Google Sheets or, you you know, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of online card sorting services, but ultimately yeah. you've got to you've got to analyze it. Yeah. No matter if it's in paper or if it's not in paper form. Uh, Yeah. That as I was reading this, I was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was kind of a goof one. Um, hang on. I'm going to point you to uh, let's see here. Uh, 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 online. Card sorting tools. Um, I'm sure you can find a YouTube video on it. Okay, here there's card sorting software. Optimal Sort is pretty good, to be completely honest. Oh, have you used Optimal Sort? I have. They use it for some of the coursework that I do for, um, what is it called? Try Design Lab. Okay. It's like part of their course stuff. How does it return the results? Does it give you like averages of who, who, like which one got placed number one? Is it frequency of number one or is it like. Um, how does, how does it re return It's just the a result? distribution of frequency. Okay. Like, depending on whatever you put in the card sort. Right, it waits on them, and then it yeah, spits you, it back you out. Yeah, can, you can, like, tweak it a little bit and make some changes, but ultimately it's basically the frequency. What was most frequently seen? Did people even, like, sort this particular one? Where they put it? Is there any kind of category that stood out? That kind of stuff. Well, there you go. Use that. Do it, Optimal yeah. Workshop. Uh, yeah, Optimal Workshop. You use that. All right, we're going to get out of here. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. I was, eh, they were okay. Uh, <laughs> if you're a Patreon supporter, please stay tuned for the after show. We are concluding the right stuff. Do you have the right stuff? Blake has the right stuff. All of it. All of it. There's an extra word in there for you, uh, for you Patreon subscribers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they know. They know. Hey, and we're getting fun with the music over there, too, because there's no... Uh, it's, there's it's no copyright problems. There's no copyright problems. Yeah, we're just, Nelly Hotton here made a made an appearance last week. So go come join the fun. Uh, for the rest of you, you can follow us all over our social channels at H Factors Podcast. If you have questions for those Ergo X folks, please be sure to email us. We got a new email, show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear, want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon. Come listen to us, you know, kind of mess See if around. you have the right stuff. Do you have the right stuff? We sure do. Maybe. I don't know. That that seemed really like full of ourselves. Wow. Not, okay, yeah, anyway. Could you be any more full of yourself, Nick? <laughs> Come on! And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Uh, special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about the right, the right stuff? stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can always find me on Twitter at DontPanicUX. <laughs> Hashtag, do you have the right stuff? As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome, making inappropriate content comments to my uh, co-host. All right. Thanks again <laughs> for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends.